The Coast to Coast AM radio show began its broadcast in the dark hours of early morning on July 29, 1998. The program regularly explored the supernatural and paranormal, ranging from topics on the Men in Black to the Mothman. The host, Art Bell, opened this particular broadcast to callers who claimed to be from the future. For hours, he fielded phone calls from individuals who unveiled their predictions about the decades to come, reveling in their moment of limelight. One report would stand out among the others. It would arrive by fax and be read aloud to millions of listeners. It was the first entry in the story of John Teeter and it would spark an investigation lasting decades. Con men, lonely hearts, believers, and skeptics, they would all play their part to an audience that still left wondering if John Teeter was a man from the future who changed our world forever. Dear Art, I had to fax when I heard other time travelers calling in from any time past the year 2500 AD. Please let me explain. Time travel was invented in 2034. Offshoots of certain successful fusion reactor research allowed scientists at CERN to produce the world's first contained singularity engine. The basic design involves rotating singularities inside a magnetic field. By altering the speed and direction of rotation, you can travel both forward and backward in time. Time itself can be understood in terms of connected lines. When you go back in time, you travel on your original timeline. When you turn the singularity engine off, a new timeline is created due to the fact that you and your time machine are now there. In other words, a new universe is created. To get back to your original line, you must travel a split second farther back and immediately throw the engine into forward without turning it off. Some interesting outcomes of this are 1. You meet yourself. I have done it often, even taken a younger version of myself along for a few rides before returning myself to the new timeline and going back to mine. 2. You can alter history in the new universe that you have just created. Most of the time, the changes are subtle. Sometimes I'll notice car models that don't exist or books that come out late. The oldest one was a skyscraper that wasn't built in a near favorite store of mine in New York. Interestingly, when you travel in time, you must compensate for the orbit of the Earth. Since the time machine doesn't move, you have to adjust the engine so you remain on the planet when you turn it off. Unfortunately, it was also discovered that anyone going forward in time from my 2036 hit a brick wall in the year 2564. Everyone who has ever been there has reported that nothing exists. When the machine is turned off, you find yourself surrounded by blackness and silence. Now, most time travelers are trying to find out where the line went bad by going into the past, creating a new universe, and proceeding forward to see if the same thing results in 25 64. It appears the line went bad around the year 2000. I'm here now in this time to test a few theories of mine before going forward. Now, for the future, you might want to know about. 1. Y2K is a disaster. Many people die on the highways when they freeze to death trying to get to warmer weather. 2. The government tries to keep 
power by instituting martial law, but all of it collapses when their efforts to bring the power back up fail. 3. A power facility in Denver is able to restart itself, but is mobbed by hundreds of thousands of people and destroyed. This convinces most that maybe we shouldn't bring the old system back up. 4. A few years later, communal government system is developed after the Constitution takes a few twists. China retakes Taiwan. Israel wins the largest battle for their life, and Russia is covered in nuclear snow from their collapsed reactors. Art, the reason I'm here now is because I believe a nuclear weapon set off by Iraq in the Middle East war with Israel might have something to do with the damaged timeline. I will test that theory and get back to you. Please pray that we discover the reason why there is no apparent future after 2564. The first John Teeter fax arrived more than 20 years ago. It touched on a fear that everyone shared, the looming Y2K disaster that occupied newspaper headlines and cable news stories across the globe. Computers supporting corporations, utility companies, and banks had formatted their years to two digits, so 1999 was entered as 99. As the computer's calendar system entered the new millennium, 99 would become double zero. Many made apocalyptic predictions proclaiming that power grids would collapse, credit and debt would be erased, and overnight the world would descend into madness. Teeter's message stood out among the others. Those callers who filled the four-hour broadcast with anxious prophecies their voices clearly unsteady or unhinged. Perhaps it was because his message addressed the fears of the time, or perhaps it was because it came from the practice delivery and familiar voice of Art Bell. Perhaps this story would have been forgotten if it ended here. Just one more prediction from one more caller. But it wouldn't end that night in 1998. It would seep into the minds of listeners, dormant, until January 27th, 2001. A companion forum to the radio show called Post to Post allowed listeners to discuss show topics and share their stories. In early 2001, John Teeter reappeared with the following message. Greetings. I am a time traveler from the year 2036. I am on my way home after getting an IBM 5100 computer system from the year 1975. My time machine is a stationary mass temporal displacement unit manufactured by General Electric. The unit is powered by two topspin dual positive singularities that produce a standard offset Tipler sinusoid. I will be happy to post pictures of the unit. The IBM 5100 was an early portable computer with a 5-inch attached monitor. It had the unique ability to emulate APL and basic programming languages. This was a hidden function known only to a handful of engineers at the time. The purpose for this computer was so that Teeter could prevent a Unix timeout in the year 2038. The year 2038 problem is Y2K reincarnated. Many digital systems store and calculate time as the number of seconds that have passed since January 1, 1970, storing this information as a 32-bit integer. This can only continue until January 2038 when, similar to Y2K, the digital calendar would be reset and misinterpreted as December 1901. Teeter explained that his time machine had been installed in a 1967 Chevy Corvette. He posted low-resolution photographs of the time travel device and answered questions about how it operated. 
However, these descriptions remain cryptic to even the most avid investigators. He even posted diagrams of his military insignia and cutaways of his time travel device. The following is an elaboration on how this time machine functioned. By using two micro-singularities in close proximity to each other, it is possible to create, manipulate, and alter the Kerr fields to create a Tipler gravity sinusoid. This field can be adjusted, rotated, and moved in order to simulate the movement of mass through a donut-shaped singularity and into an alternate world line, thus safe time travel. Many believers contribute our survival of the Y2K disaster to Teeter's presence, and they suggest that he may be responsible for other instances of the Mandela effect. This is an unusual phenomenon when a large group of people share memories that are divergent from reality. Some suggest these are altered memories caused by changes earlier in the world line. Teeter seemed to suggest that his presence had already impacted our world. You are headed toward the same events I would call my history in 2036. However, the very nature of time travel states that every world line is unique, and you are very much in control of what you do and how you get there. Heck, the fact that I'm here makes it different from mine. The future Teeter described was equal parts apocalyptic and idyllic. A series of Russian nuclear strikes were predicted to devastate major US and European urban centers. The Olympics were to be cancelled due to global tensions, and an epidemic of Crutzfeld Jakob disease gripped humanity. America would crumble under the weight of a second civil war. In the aftermath, the nation would be split into five warring factions. The 2030s would be a time when living was communal, dependent on local connections of family and region. Teeter claimed that future generations would hate us for our laziness and avarice. We would be described as fattened calves waiting for slaughter. Believers claim that Teeter's failed predictions are the result of his interference, that Teeter is a savior figure who intervened in ways that we can't understand to prevent a fate we'll never see. Whether or not John Teeter was fact or fiction, the people connected to his story are very real. The facets of their humanity are exposed through him. It's almost as if Teeter is a litmus test for the character of all those involved. Pamela Moore was a frequent contact of John Teeter's. She recounts that her connection began even before she met him. In April of 1998, she had a detailed dream of time traveling in a car with a man. When she encountered Teeter on the forums, she pursued him with detailed questions, looking for some deeper truth. While initially, her interrogations could have been interpreted as her looking for a reason to doubt him, it could have been just as likely as her looking for a reason to believe. As Teeter described his time-traveling vehicle, he mentioned having to stop in April of 1998. It was this detail that won over Pamela. She began more direct correspondences with Teeter, on and off the forums. In an interview, she recounts her time spent communicating with Teeter with longing, a subtext of wistfulness. Before he disappeared, Teeter provided Pamela with an original song. It was to be used if they ever spoke again in the future. This would let her know that she was speaking to the real John Teeter. Pamela received a package as recently as September 2016. It contained a letter from Teeter's mother, from Teeter himself, an album, and a CD. The exact songs or artists have not been revealed. Pamela stated in an interview that she was keeping it a secret because she wasn't sure why these items were sent, but she has faith that she will learn in time. 
However, Pamela has shared the first paragraph of John's letter to her. Dear Pam, Over what has been 15 years, I've considered you to be a dear friend who deserves the best explanation I can give. You should know that your efforts played an important role in allowing me a chance to get home. Skeptics point to Pamela Moore with concern, a cautionary tale for those who believe. Her faith in Teeter and her willingness to follow the rabbit hole have led her to connect with a man who may have never existed at all. In the final moments of her interview, she concluded by saying, quote, I have to say he does seem a little different than the John I spoke to, but I honestly don't know what that means. I'm older. He may be a different age also. The John that I talked to before just seemed so much closer to me. Joseph Matheny was a multimedia artist and a former employee of Adobe and Netscape in the early 90s. He was responsible for Ong's Hat, one of the first known ARGs, or alternate reality games. These are narratives that are told across multiple forms of media, like videos, forum posts, photographs, and more, requiring the audience to actively investigate and decipher clues. Matheny claimed that he was a consultant for the John Teeter Project, a new ARG that was architected by a group of unnamed individuals. The conspiratorial nature of coast-to-coast -coast listeners breathed life into the ARG in a way that was unexpected. The narrative played to familiar topics like apocalyptic events, decentralized governments, and time travel. However, the narrative quickly took on a life of its own, and Matheny pressured the group to tell the truth about the story of John Teeter. Matheny claims that this group stopped participating in the perpetuation of John Teeter's story sometime in 2000, and it's worth mentioning that Matheny's statements have never been corroborated. Larry Haber was an attorney who appeared shortly after Teeter's last post on the forums. Haber was an entertainment attorney who previously provided legal services to Walt Disney World and Universal Studios. He claimed to legally represent John and Kay Teeter, although there was no substantiating evidence that either existed. He handled all public relations for the Teeter estate and he formed the John Teeter Foundation, LLC. This led many to speculate he was a con man trying to capitalize. Some even speculate that Larry's brothers, Richard and Maury, may have been involved. Maury Haber is a computer programmer who would have had the expertise to create the digital footprint for John Teeter. Currently, Maury works for Beyond Trust, an identity protection company, and even now, his blog posts contain nods to Teeter's legacy. Investigator John Rasmus has proposed that many of the posters on the forum who interacted with Teeter were actually fictitious users created by the hoaxers for the purpose of pushing the narrative. He claims that a total of 88 users were fictional individuals created for this purpose. Even more convincingly, multiple investigators have forensically analyzed the writings of John Teeter, Larry Haber, and Maury Haber. Several have concluded that Maury and Teeter share many linguistic similarities, implying they are the same person. To this day, the Habers continue to deny participating in the creation of a hoax. However, one man would take it a step further, claiming to be John Teeter II. Unconstrained by time, countless John Teeters from other world lines would stumble into ours. John Teeter II claimed to be one of these alternate versions. Teeter II rushed to commoditize his story, saying, quote, Lots of people call themselves John Teeter. I'm the only one who ever gets photographed, goes on television, or has written a book. Unquote. A year later, Teeter II was outed during a radio broadcast of Late Night in the Midlands. Michael Vera, the show's host, exposed Teeter II after following Amazon payment slips and conducting background checks. 
Teeter too was revealed to be Dana Lee Stern Sr., who had an extensive criminal record and numerous pseudonyms. Stern's fraudulent signature under the name John Teeter II voided his contract with biographers, dissolving his book deal. Teeter II has not been heard from since. There were many who believed John Teeter was a man from the future, and some even believed that his impact here spared us cascading catastrophes. He brought certainty in a time when much was uncertain, and although his evidence was pixelated, its clarity lost in low resolution, he produced photographs and diagrams as proof of his claims. He delivered predictions, and he emphasized that we could change things for the better. He gave agency and control to people who felt scared and helpless. For that same reason, many believe Teeter was a fiction. They claim he was an art project or a grifter who was looking for fame that could be transmuted into wealth. Skeptics point to the same evidence and claim it's clear that Teeter was a confidence man. It's not about whether or not John Teeter was who he said he was. In the small hours of the morning when you feel like you might be the only person still awake, there was a voice on the radio claiming to be from the future. He was a man who was completely alone in the world, knowing no one and still reaching out to you all the same. In his final post on March 24th, 2001, John Teeter would conclude his arc on the Post to Post forum. It would read as follows. I will be leaving this world line shortly, and this will be my final post. There are only a handful of people who will know exactly when I will be leaving, and I'm sure they will let you know when I'm gone. In the last few days, I have found your choice of topics quite interesting, and from an objective viewpoint, I think it collectively answers one of your own questions. If time travel is real, where are all the time travelers? In the past, I have stated that quite frankly, you all scare the hell out of me, and I'm sure other temporal drivers would feel the same. But now I have an expanded explanation with two examples. A while ago, on one of the posts, I related an experience I had with my parents while we were driving down a highway. Every now and then, we would pass someone who was in obvious distress with their vehicle. I was amazed that so many people could pass them by without stopping to help. Their explanation was fear. The risk of helping someone was too great, and with today's technology, they probably had a cell phone anyway. If they didn't, the walk to a gas station would be good for them and teach them a lesson for running out of gas. The other example is the plight of the homeless. When you pass them as individuals on the street, I see the way people selectively choose an alternate path to avoid them. Those two examples best define why time travelers do not show themselves. In trying to help you, we put ourselves at great risk, and there's really no point to it. We know the nature of time dictates that traveling between exact world lines is impossible. Therefore, the only results we will see will be the ones we stay to see. Since world lines, outcomes, and events are infinite, we have better things to do. When I arrive in the new 1998 world line on my way home, I could easily start all of this again and continue to go through the same conversations with all of the same people. However, I already know you won't pay any attention or believe me because we've already been through it on this world line. Besides, I think the walk to the gas station will do you some good. I also want to thank Pamela for helping me with the email and everyone else who asked intelligent and insightful questions. I have learned a great deal. What amazes me is why no one here wonders why Y2K didn't hit them at all. Bring a gas can with you when the car dies on the side of the road. Farewell, John.